Good morning. Good to have uh, the crowd we have here uh, this morning. Got a few visitors. Glad uh, that you guys are here as well. Got some family in, looks like. Um, it's a great part of uh, about Christmas time of year, getting to spend some time with family. Uh, our order of worship this morning, Brother Larry will be leading singing, and his first number is 733. 733. Uh, Eddie Lindsay will have the opening prayer. Uh, Greg Bryant will have the closing prayer. Brother Mack will have uh, scripture reading. And then Joel Gann uh, will preside over the Lord's Supper at that time. I got a few uh, sick to update and announce on. Uh, Brother Curtis's surgery will be uh, tomorrow in Mobile. Uh, so remember him. Um, Carter Scruggs' surgery on his hand is also tomorrow. Um, Mackenzie Gann, uh, this is Joel and Samantha's daughter. Uh, she'll have tubes put in her ears and her adenoids taken out also tomorrow at Flowers Hospital uh, in Dothan. So remember uh, Curtis, Carter, and Mackenzie tomorrow as they have uh, surgery. Uh, Sammy Sutton is at home with bronchitis. Um, He's still scheduled to have the stent put in to correct the blockage he has in his abdomen uh, and his leg this coming Friday, December the 22nd. Um, Judy Dillard, she does remain in the Baptist South Hospital in Montgomery. Uh, she's improved and doing a lot better, and she gets to come, hopes to get to come home midweek this week. Uh, so continue to remember her and her family. Uh, Joey Terman, you know, as we announced, that's Brother Larry's brother. Uh, he's still having some kidney issues uh, and asked to, to keep him on the prayer list. Uh, Peter Gavin, uh, this is the brother of Karen Bozeman, is in the hospital in Pensacola, and he's in critical condition at this time. Waylon Hood, uh, this is the four-year-old nephew of Brother Randy Frost. Okay, so they, they've moved Waylon out of ICU into a regular room, um, and if he can adapt to, his oxygen levels can adapt to the room, then they'll let him go home maybe today or tomorrow. So just kind of have to see how that goes. But continue to remember uh, Waylon Hood. Uh, Joe Keller, he's still at home recovering uh, from bronchitis. Um, in the way of sympathy, uh, sympathy is extended to the family of Randy Cornelius, who passed away on Wednesday. Uh, a memorial service will be held at 3 p.m. at the Luverne Church of Christ uh, in Luverne, Alabama. Um, there is an updated prayer list on the table in the foyer. I know a lot changes and it's pretty dynamic, but um, pick those up as often as you can. Um, it includes all those who are uh, taking treatment, those in nursing homes, and other various needs. They've asked for prayers from the church. All right, some other church announcements uh, that we have. Uh, remember, uh, Jed and Heather are collecting donations to help purchasing the items for the stocking project uh, that is done by the youth each year. Um, for This is for those who are sick and shut in. Uh, there's a sheet on the table in the foyer if you'd like to add the name of someone who you would like to get a stocking. Uh, today is the last day to add a name. So if you have somebody who you'd like to get a stocking, today is the last day to add that. Um, for the youth, um, the stockings will be stuffed this upcoming Wednesday, uh, the 20th, uh, at 9 a.m. Um, let me out in the annex, Heather. Uh, out in the annex this Wednesday at 9 a.m., the youth will uh, load the, the stockings for the, for the shut-ins. Um, Tomorrow, December the 18th, will be Sister Mildred Stokes' 90th birthday. Uh, you remember she's in room 217 at the Andalusia Manor. Um, be a good time to send her a card or, or pay her a visit uh, for her 90th birthday. Uh, don't forget, Sunday night, 
December 31st, we'll have a New Year's Eve party uh, after evening services. Uh, everyone's asked to bring finger foods and snacks for the meal. Uh, there'll be fireworks around 7 p.m. Um, don't forget, there'll be a money tree for uh, Trent, for some reason. Hazel, Susan, and Donnell in the annex. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to give money, if, so if you won't be here on the 31st and you want to give money to that, see Roddy or Kristen for that. Uh, the Digging Deeper Ladies Bible Class will be meeting this Wednesday at 10 a.m. in the church library. Uh, pantry item for this month is soup and peanut butter. So next Sunday, Christmas Eve, we'll have our regular morning uh, services. So we'll have Bible class at 9.30, worship at 10.30, and then there'll be no evening service next Sunday on Christmas Eve. Also a reminder, there's no fellowship meal today, uh, and our evening services will be at 5 p.m. Um, also, we have a newsletter from the work in Romania, uh, Brother Harvey Starling and, and Miss Pat. Um, there's copies on the table out in the foyer. Uh, if you want to pick one of those up and get updated on the work there in Romania. Um, that's all the announcements I have. Appreciate everybody being here again, and we'll turn it over to Brother Larry. I love you, Brother Trent. <laughs> 7.33, as was announced, is our first song. We'll sing all four stanza this morning as we begin our worship. Our next song, 560. Let's turn to 560. <clears throat> sing the first and the full stand. <clears throat> Let's sing. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his. How I trust 
him how I prove to you more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I Song for prayer, let's turn to 429. 429. <clears throat> 429. First and third. First and third. 429. Let us sing. I come to the Lord. Bow. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time thanking you for this Lord's day and the time you blessed us to be here to worship you and study from your word, Father. Father, we thank you for your love you have for us and for sending your only Son to die on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven. And Father, also we thank you for Christ and his love for us and his willing to fulfill this destiny that was laid out for him, giving us our forgiveness, mercy, and grace, things that we require each and every day, Father. Father, thank you for this church and the firm foundation it stands on and the good work it does, it serves for you and its reputation it has all over for all this, Father. And pray this church remain on, on this, this path it is on right now and that we would all, not just the elders and deacons and those that 
serve in different offices here, different positions, but we would all work to keep this church on that foundation and that reputation going, Father. For them, and though there's been mentioned here this morning that we're having different health concerns, surgeries and procedures that lie ahead for them, pray your healing blessings upon them and things that are being done for them would be successful in restoring their health, Father. Also, we know that there are those who maybe have burdens and difficulties are going through in their lives right now that pray your comforting blessings upon them and that they will look to you for these, this comfort knowing it only can come from you. Father, you bless us so richly each and every day for the more that we reserve and that we can ever be worthy of. We thank you for these blessings and as you bless us, Father, we do pray that we will in turn be a blessing to others. Father, as we enter this period of worship, I pray we will worship you in spirit and truth and we'll focus on the lesson brought to us this morning by Trent and that we will grow strong with you and our walk with you, Father, and be a better witness to others we come in contact with and set a better example for you. I pray now you forgive us our sins in Christ's name. Amen. Prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. Let's turn to 364. 364. Trying real hard this morning to stay on these lines. I've got a new pair of glasses and bifocals. How many's got bifocals? Stumble down and get up <laughs> and get off the wrong line? Ooh, man, got to get used to it. Let's sing the first, third, and fourth stanza of this song before we partake of the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> Let's sing. I can
Is there anyone that needs one of the communion packets? If you would just raise your hand and Usher will bring one to you. In Paul's first letter to, uh, to Corinth, he reaffirms the uh, institution of the Lord's Supper. It says, what's that? Okay, sorry. In uh, Paul's first, uh, uh, in Paul's letter to Corinth, he reaffirms the, uh, the institution of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians 23, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner... He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Uh, will you pray for the, uh, the bread with me? Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this bread and the body that it represents. We thank you for the sacrifice that was made on the cross for our sins. Uh, we pray that we receive this bread in a manner that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, will you bow with me again as we give thanks for the, uh, the cup? Dear Lord, we thank you for this, this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed on the cross. Um, we thank you for your our sacrifice, or for your sacrifice that we are, we know we're not worthy of. We just, we thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. We pray that you, uh, that we take this, this cup in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. At this time, we've also set aside time to give uh, thanks for the offering. If you would, uh, bow with me as, I, as we pray over the offering. Dear Most Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for our, our many monetary blessings in this life. We thank you for each and everything that you've given to us. We thank you for our jobs that we're able to provide for our families. Um, we thank you for our abilities and just our health and our many blessings, Lord. Uh, we pray that... We give back in a, with a cheerful heart and that it's in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'd like to take this opportunity, Mark, 876 will be our song of invitation, 876. Before Brother Trent comes and ministers to us, let's turn to 480, 480. We'll sing the first and third stanza. If it's convenient for you and you can, please stand. <clears throat>
scripture reading this morning will be from Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Philippians 2, verse 2. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other and working together with one mind and purpose. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to see all of you today. I know for a while we had a drought and we were praying for rain and we got it. It's been praying, I feel like, for a week now. But it's such a pleasure to, I mean, we're so blessed to have this building where we can be inside and away from the elements. I know there are times when it's cold and times when it's hot um, outside, but it's definitely a a blessing to, to be in here. If you have your hymnals, please turn to number 281. 281, we're going to sing, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah, before we dive into our lesson today. 281. We'll sing all three verses before we look at our lesson this morning. 281. Guide me. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We'll be reading from there shortly. You know, I don't say it enough, but I love every single one of you, except Russell Rigdon. No, no, I'm joking. He needs some extra love. I love you too, Russell. Don't worry. Today, today we're going to be talking about God's will. God's will. There's a famous poet by the name of Charles Hummel, and he wrote Freedom from Tyranny of the Urgent. This is actually one of his books. Freedom from Tyranny of the Urgent by Charles Hummel, and there's a great quote in there, and it goes like this. Commitment to the will of God, the purpose for which we are designed, offers freedom to become the person we are meant to be. I really like that quote. I like it so much, I'll say it again. Commitment to the will of God, the purpose for which we are designed, offers freedom to become the person we were meant to be. I wholeheartedly agree with that statement. This morning, we're going to look at different characteristics, different adjectives about 
the will of God. Number one, God's will is perfect. God's will is perfect. Here we are in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, when we look at this verse a lot, that's usually the part that we focus on. You know, we focus, okay, do not be conformed to this world, rightly so, but have that transforming, renewing by the mind. But transforming to what? It goes on, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, and there it is, perfect will of God, the perfect will of God. You know, we think about our own will at times. We think about even our own wants or our own desires or what we think we need. Doesn't that change a lot? Doesn't our will change often? I hope so. You know, maybe when I was very, very young, the only thing that I willed was maybe have a horse. Maybe I wanted, the only will that I had was to have a big birthday party. And maybe I grow up and those wills change. You know, maybe you've even looked back and realized that what you wanted was the worst thing that you could have ever wanted. Maybe there's a time when you looked back in your life and your will changed, but for the good. I hope so. I hope that, you know, as we mature, we realize that our will changes. Why is that? Well, because we grow, we mature, we change. But that doesn't happen with God. Therefore, his will is always perfect. And that's why we see in verse 2 that we are transforming to get like the will of God. It's not the other way around. It's not the fact that, okay, God is changing and he, and we are God and he is the one molding to us. No, he is always steadfast. His will is always perfect. His will is always unchanging. And that goes to number two. God's will is perpetual. So God's will, number one, God's will is perfect. Number two, God's will is perpetual. Turn over to the book of James chapter one. James chapter one, we'll camp there for a little bit. Perpetual, that means it is never ending. That means it is never changing. And why is that? If you think about it, it goes back to point number one, because God's will is perfect. If God's will is perfect, then it never needs to change, and it never will end, because he is God, and his will is perpetual. James 1, verse 17. It says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You know, we think about our friends, our family, every single person that we come in contact, contact with. And that person, and guess what? It includes us. They've had bad days. They've had good days. They've had sad days. They've had angry days. They've had depressing days. They've had cheerful days. But when it comes to God, yes, he does have emotions. However, and we can see that with his love and with his joy and with his wrath. However, all of those emotions are perfect. That is what is different between us and the people that we interact with, is that our emotions might negatively affect our will. But when it comes to God, since it is God, and since God's will is perfect, and since it is perpetual, it goes on, it is never affected by anything else. We see that again, as it says, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Not only is that talking about his will, that is talking about God himself. You know, you never have to second guess God. 
You never have to wonder if his will has hidden motives or if there is a, a slant or if there is something that, will later, that we will later regret. You know, we'll never regret doing God's will. Now, there might be a time when we're doing God's will and we might not have addressed it correctly. We might have had good intentions and we might not have, um, you know, thought, of, thought about a certain plan or something like that. But that's, that's what I, I hate to say. That's, that's called life. Because we, even though we're dealing with a perfect God, we're not in a perfect world. So, yes, we might have, we might, doing, we might be doing God's will, but there are times where we might need to adjust how we are doing it. But that doesn't mean that we jump to conclusions and realize that, okay, since maybe um, we're trying to do God's will and it's not going well, that we're just going to throw up our hands and say that, that God is, is just not there. With whom there's no variation or shadow of turning. There's not even a shadow. There's not even an image of God having um, his will altered or thrown away or changed or going back. Have you ever gone back on a promise or gone back on your word? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever said words that you later regret? I know I have. That's never happened with God and it never will happen. It goes on. God's will is perfect. God's will is perpetual. It is never ending. It is also personal. Us knowing God's will is important because it is personable. Personal. Let's look at the next verse right quick in verse 18 of James chapter 1. It says, of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. Why did he bring us forth? Because of his own will. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. He wants a personal relationship with you. He wants a personal relationship with all of us. And that is indeed his will. Why is that so important for us? Well, let's think about this a moment. We think about powerful people in this world. The first person that comes to mind is the king of England, King Charles III. You know, he's a very powerful man, and, and he has a will. But guess what? I am not doing whatever I can to find out what his will is. He's not doing whatever he can to have a relationship with me. I'm not, you know, striving to see what he thinks or what he wants me to do. And he is not, you know, giving, sacrificing everything he has to have a relationship with me. You know, frankly, we don't care about each other. But that's not with God. God's will is to have a personal relationship with you. Now we can ebb and flow with that relationship. You know, a lot of times I find myself sadly focusing only on the tangible when it comes to God. Maybe, you know, I will only see about the physical blessings. I will only think about the physical congregation. But are we having a relationship with God? You know, once we dwell on, you know, the profits and losses, if you will, sadly we'll look up and we'll end up like the Pharisees. Where, yes, we might have every T cross and I dotted, but there's no heart. There's no love. There's no relationship with God. Well, Trent, how do we change that? Well, a big thing is that we go out and realize that we're following God. And he loves us, so I need to love like he does. I need to love my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Realize that I am just as a sinner as every single person in this world. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And that I need the blood of Jesus just like anybody else. We need to get that humility back. You know? It's like a scale. If our humility goes down, well then guess what? Or I guess it's not really like a scale because it's kind of equal. You know, if our humility goes down, then our relationship with the Lord goes down. 
But if our humility increases, then our love for Christ increases. Of his own will, he might brought us forth by the word of truth. You know, God did not send Jesus Christ on the cross just a clean house, just to, you know, make it look like, oh, he is good and he's going to, uh, he's just showing how great he is and how powerful he is. No, it did do that. It did show how powerful God is, but we see why. That he brought us forth by the truth that we might be kind of first fruits of his creatures so that we may be saved. God's will is perfect. God's will is perpetual. God's will is personal. God's will is planned. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. This is a popular passage. A passage that many people know. Some call it the Lord's Prayer. And a lot of times we might say or hear this prayer so much that we forget to dive deep into it and uncover what it has to say. In verse 10, look at what it says. This is Jesus Christ. Given the manner, the model prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean? Well, we know that in heaven, there is no flaws. We know that in heaven, there is no problems. We know that in heaven, everything is of utmost perfection. So much more where there's not a word in the English language to describe how great it will be. And that is what we want, is that the will of God on heaven is here on earth. If we hear the word, we believe it, we put on Christ in baptism, you know, we continue to repent and we remain steadfast till death. We'll go to Abraham's bosom and then we, when the judgment comes, we will go to heaven. And guess what? In heaven, there will be no variation of a will. There will be no changing of a something planned. There will, the plans will never be different. That's how it is in heaven. There's nothing that we can do to go against God's planned will in heaven. But here's the thing. We can do that now. You know, God has a plan for us. God's will is that we become his children and that we do whatever we can to be like his son. But what happens? We go against that plan. We fight against it. We try to do our own plan in life. We try to plan our own day. We try to plan our own future on our own desires, our own sinful yearnings. We might plan only around our own leisure or our own excitement or our own entertainment. But we need to look at God's will. And just as God's will is perfectly done in heaven, we need to do whatever we can to have God's will perfect with us in our life. Turn the page over to Matthew chapter 721. Matthew chapter 721. I know we're looking at a lot of passages today, but I promise it's worth it. Because God's will is perfect. God's will is perpetual. God's will is personal. God's will is planned. But also, God's will is practiced. God's will is practiced. What do I mean by this? I mean that when it comes to God's will for us to be saved, there's something for us to do. Look at chapter, uh, uh, verse 21. One of the scariest verses in the whole Bible. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Okay, we have the will of God right here. Do we just let it sit? Do we just let it mold, if you will? Absolutely not. We make sure that it is alive in our life by doing it. Doing the will of the Father in heaven. It's practice in our life. 
I feel that unfortunately today the pendulum is on one side or the other. Sadly today we might even fall into having one problem or the other, one extreme or the other. What two extremes am I talking about? Well, we have this camp. And this camp loves to learn about the Bible, loves to learn about the will of God. They might even have a lot of it memorized. They study it day in and day out about what the will of God is. But they never do it. And then you have this camp over here. This camp over here, they would love to, they just love being busy and doing and being active. But their thinking is wrong. They don't know anything about the will of God. Because they don't look at it. They don't study it. They don't learn it. What is good for, of course, those two camps to come together? It'd be good for us to be right in the middle where, yes, we learn and study about it. Then we actually do it. There's a preacher named Francis Chan, and no, I don't agree with everything that he teaches, but he's really good at making illustrations, and I'm going to steal one. Francis Chan talks about cleaning our room. He talks about how there's a, a father, and he goes to his son, and he says, son, go clean your room, and the son goes off. A few hours pass by, and the father comes to the son and says, hey, did you clean your room? He said, no, I didn't clean my room. But I studied about how you said, son, go clean your room. I looked at the different correlations between that and other words. I thought about, okay, how can I teach others how to clean their room? I studied how, you know, what, what it would mean for me to clean my room and what it would look like if I cleaned my room. But the young boy didn't clean his room. You know, it's... There has to be will in it to actually do it. Not only find out what the will of God is, but to go and do it. And just like that father, is he going to be happy because, oh yes, you understood what I said, you memorized what I said, you understood it, but you never actually did it. The father's going to be disappointed. The, young, the son didn't obey. What if the father goes to the son and says, okay, I want you to clean your room. And he goes and he is so active. He goes outside. He goes to a friend's house. He calls, for, you know, he, he, he fellowships with, with other people. He goes out and does things that are fun. He might even do things that would be seen as good. But he never cleaned his room. Is the father going to be disappointed? Yes. You have to know, okay, what the will of God is. That is of utmost importance. But then guess what? In hand in hand, you actually got to do you got to do it. It's practice. God's will is perfect. It's perpetual. It's personal. It's planned. It's practice. It's also providential. Let's look over in 1 John chapter 1. You know, there's a book of John, then there's a book of 1 John. We looked at it, I guess, two weeks ago in our adult class. In the book of 1 John. In the book of 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 17. First John chapter 2, verse 17. It says, and the world is passing away and the lust of it. Think about everything that we might work for here on earth. We think about all the hours that we put into work or education or our physicalness or activities all that is passing away we think about all the things that we tread water in the lust of it the things that aren't worthwhile at all but it goes on verse 17 and the world is passing away and the lust of it but he who does the will of God abides forever Church, I don't know about you, but I want to do stuff that lasts forever. Doesn't that sound great? I want to do stuff where, and I, and I want to be busy in the things where it is important. That is one reason why I personally became a preacher. Because I felt if I'm going to do anything, I want to do something that is of utmost worthwhile. 
Now, here's the thing. You don't have to become a preacher to go to heaven. No. You don't have to have an occupation that is in the Christian realm to go to heaven. We see that all throughout scripture, by the way, in the New Testament. But here's the thing. Are we putting, are we laying our treasures in heaven or our treasures here on earth? If it's here on earth, it's going to be a waste. We think about every single dollar that we've worked for. What if we put all the money in the whole world? We put it in a pile. It's going to be one big pile. Might even go to the sun. All the money there. We think about all the achievements that anyone has ever made. We think about all the technological advances ever thought of. We think about every acre of land. And if we had all of it, that still would not be worth our soul. But what does? What is our soul based on? Whether we do the will of God. And we will abide forever. Did you know the things that we do here on earth will determine where we spend eternity? The small decisions lead to the medium-sized decisions. The medium-sized decisions lead to the large. The large leads to extra large. And that continues and it goes on all the way to where we spend eternity, where we go after we die. Decisions are important. Providential. That means that there is divine intervention. That means that when we are doing God's will, he is active in our life. I don't know about you, but I don't want to live this life alone. You know, I don't want to be here alone. I don't, I don't want to walk this path by myself. Life can be nasty. Life can, life can be scary. Life can be dark. Life can be distressing. I want God to be in my life. I want to walk with him. Last but certainly not least, God's will is priority. God's will is perfect, perpetual, personal, planned, practice, providential. And it's also priority. The last verse for the day, I promise. Turn your Bibles over to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 18. Actually, what we'll do, verse 16. If we want to win at life, at being a Christian, this is how to do it. There's three things that we need to do. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks. If we have all three of those, it's amazing how amazing our life will become. Goes on. For this is the will of God in Christ for you. A lot of times when we look at those three things, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, we look over those absolute words. What are those absolute words? You know, like always and never. Those are two examples of absolute words. We have those. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, not stopping. In everything give thanks. Always, without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. What does that mean? Well, that means that I need to put my life as a Christian first, and then everything follows. A lot of times we might see our faith as an extracurricular activity. Where, okay, we have sports, okay, we have school, okay, we have work, okay, we have family. And then another thing to put on the plate is church. That's not how it was intended to be, and that is not how it is supposed to be. It is not an extracurriculum curricular activity. It is the curriculum. It is our life. Everything molds to it. That is the will of God in Christ. Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5. 
19. Church, God's will is that you become one of his children. And we see how to do that when we hear about the word of God. We hear it, we believe it because it's truth. We repent of our sins. We confess that Jesus is Lord and that we put on Christ in baptism. The Baptist tree is ready. Maybe you've already done that. And you have focused more on your own will rather than God's will. We've all done it. And we need to come back to the Lord. Just like the prodigal son came back to his loving father. His arms are always open. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you're struggling to see God's will for your life. And you need to... uh, be encouraged. You need, um, and, you, know, you need support from your brothers and sisters and, of course, from the Lord. If there's anything that we could do from you if, right now, is a perfect time to come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song. For that lesson. Appreciate that. Remember tonight or this afternoon, or excuse me, this evening, get it right, evening, five o'clock, we will assemble back here for our evening service. And uh, it'll be good to see each and every one of you to return, if you can and if you will, to be with us at that time. <clears throat> Is there any other announcements before we're dismissed? If you will, turn to 944. We'll sing the first stanza of this song as before we have our closing closing prayer. Five nine four four. Joy to the world.
Our most righteous and loving Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you at the close of this worship service, Father, thanking you again for another beautiful Lord's Day that you've given to us. Father, we just thank you so much for the privilege and the opportunity we've had to, to worship here this morning and pray that all that we have done this morning has been pleasing to you and in keeping with your will, Father. We just thank you so much for uh, our church family. We want to ask, a, again, a special uh, prayer for those that are facing surgeries and, and procedures throughout this week and those that are home uh, ill with whatever it may be, that, that you will uh, great, your greatest blessings will be with them and their recovery, Father. Uh, we thank you for this lesson that we've heard this morning. We just pray that you will help us, each one as, as children of, of yours, that we will humbly uh, submit to the, your will and to follow your will, Father, daily as we go out into the world, that, uh, that when we depart from this life, that we will stand just in front of you and that we can uh, spend eternity with you in heaven, Father. We just pray that you'll continue to be with us. Uh, help us to let our light shine to those around us, that others can see Christ in us and ask you to forgive us when we do wrong. In Christ's name, amen.